All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Q&A session with Carmen. This is just our follow up to the TM basics webinar. There were a few questions that we didn't have. To, so Carmen and I thought we would uh, make this little video today just to answer uh, the remaining questions from that session. So the first question is, how do you evaluate the radiation damage on soft materials? Yeah, so soft materials are not very easy to, to get in TM. So what I would suggest first is to choose carefully the voltage of the microscope when you look at soft materials. So um, definitely use less than 100 kilovolt. Uh, I don't know if you have 80 or 60, that's, that's the best I would say. Um, and also if you can use the cryo holder, to cool down your sample so that will prevent to have more damage in your sample so actually you are cooling down the sample that will keep nitrogen temperature so um, that should i mean depending on the sample you have that should help for it but yeah as i said soft materials are not very easy to look at in that yam okay next question please um, slide 30, what okay. is the ratio between spots? Okay, so this is this is the slide 30. So what we need to do when we index the diffraction pattern, uh, I can, let me see if I can oops, zoom in in that. That's the one. So we need the ratio. those spots you see so this distance is l l over n and m over n so you need those ratios in order to index the diffraction pattern so i mean you need to have the sample in a zone axis and then you need to calculate the ratio if you can so yeah i hope you can see that if not this is from williams and carter book okay is nano diffraction used for more detailed or does it depend on sample thickness so when we do nano diffraction in stem mode you want to analyze small areas less than two nanometer in size so we definitely need to have the sample really thin for that and um yeah so we always look at small areas so you can you can image, you can get diffraction pattern from areas less than two nanometer. Okay. Why would you use ring diffraction instead of spot diffraction? Okay, so um, that's depending on the sample you have. So if you have a polycrystalline sample, you will gonna get ring. Patterns. If you have a single crystal sample, you will kind of get spots. So it's not something you choose, it's something what you have. Um, I would say it's a bit easier to index the diffraction pattern from uh, rings. But again, this, this is depending on the type of the sample you have. Can yields and EDX be measured at the same time? And yields and EDX give complementary information, or can we or can we also map at the same time? Um, so for people who are using digital micrograph to acquire data at the microscope, there is one uh, package um, in digital micrograph where you can acquire an ILS and EDX in the same time. So ILS. It's mostly used for light elements and EDX for heavier. So if you have in your sample both this type of elements, light and heavy, that would be really useful to use this technique. So um, again, this is just in digital micrograph. So I don't know if other programs they would like TIA, they have, they have this option to acquire uh, an ILS and EDX in the same time. Um, there is a disadvantage of that because in EDX usually you need more counts so you're probably gonna get less counts when you do that in digital micrograph 
but uh, you can get the the elements in the same time uh, uh, in EDX and in ELS. On slide 42, what is the difference between MN304 nano and bulk? Okay, that's a very good question. Um, the authors of this paper I mentioned here, uh, they bought some standard elements from a chemical company. So those are the MnO2, MnO2O3, and MnO3O4 bulk, and MnO. So the one they call nano is the one they actually synthesize, and then they characterize it by that by that group. So they just call it nano and they wanted to, to see how this material they synthesize compares with the other one from the chemical compound. So that's the difference between the nano and the bulk. So yeah, I guess if you can read the paper, you can find it online, you can find out more about that. In EOs, is there a limitation with low Z number element detections like in EDS? Uh, in ELS, you can detect the light element. So you can even detect the, the molecular hydrogen. So I would say there is no limitation for the light element. So heavy elements might be harder to acquire depending which kind of spectrometer you have. But for light elements, there is no limitation in it. So the next question, what do you mean by each spot in an SAD pattern? What would be the effect of sample tilting and what do we get by doing that? And then also, in regards to the Kikuchi lines, how do you use them to navigate your experiment? Okay, so when you do diffraction, you need to have the sample in the double tilt quarter because you need to tilt. So um, a typical double tilt holder can tilt like, I don't know, minus 50, plus 50 in X direction or alpha direction and, I don't know, 40 minus 40 in the beta direction or Y direction. So when you see those Kikuchi lines, like the one I have in here on the left side, you need to move them by tilting the sample towards the center of the, the screen. So, um, just by tilting either X or Y direction, you can move those Kikuchi lines in the center. So if you have a map like this, like um, just looking on this, I mean, if you know which structure you have, um, you might know that you have to move like 30 degrees from this orientation to another orientation. So, um, um, the other question was, what, um, what do you real, what, do, what was it? Oh. What, uh, what the you other question was, was, what do you mean by each spot in the SED pattern? And um, yeah, what do you get by tilting your sample? So when we tilt the sample, it's actually, we move the sample and we call it in a high symmetry orientation. And then uh, it's easier for us to index the diffraction pattern. Can you explain what the scale means per nanometer in, in some of the images? Yeah, so the diffraction pattern is taken in the reciprocal space, which is the inverse of the direct space. So that's why the scale bar in the diffraction pattern is always going to be one over nanometer. Uh, when you want to measure a distance in the diffraction pattern on the reciprocal space, we need to inverse that to get the real distance in the direct space. So that's why always in the diffraction pattern, we're going to have one over nanometer, because it's not the same as the image, the direct space, the image. Right? Another dispersion test for the powder sample, for example, by compression. 
Um, we never use compression in PM, so that use if you want to look at the sample in scanning electron microscopy. So uh, for powder sample in PM, we always like to disperse it well on the TM grid. So yeah, we never use any compression technique. 